it's a great pleasure to uh, you know first of all recognize and uh, be a part of this second uh, cpp foundation day lecture i think cpp is one of the uh, good think tanks in public policy set up at iim bangalore in uh, 2000 so it's a you know this is in a sense the 20 20 years i think last year it was really in uh the fact that we have reached that milestone that's when it got started in cpp uh so this is the second year and i'm really happy that uh, you know last year hema swaminathan was the chair of cpp and there was a transition to shri ram and i'm happy that uh, you know the tradition is uh, stabilizing now and and will continue to be a tradition uh well you know i you know given the current situation you know otherwise uh, there could have been the possibility of doing something at the <clears throat> beautiful campus of iim bangalore but then everything is going online and uh, it's it's a different way of doing it uh i well tridip and uh, you know a special welcome to you i i'm not sure whether we uh, you know directly had interactions uh, but i i wouldn't be surprised if we have crossed ways i mean i've been 31 years at i am ahmedabad and have in fact even taught at sept uh, i used to you know do something in the area of transportation and uh, so you know whenever something uh, was happening there uh, so of course since then sept has come a long way and uh, uh, you know it's good to know of your uh, connection with sept and of course some of the other uh, you know institutions there the uh, sabarmati ashram or the uh, ld institute of indology um, you know and i think <laughs> you know when i see i mean it looks like what gandhi has gandhi ji has created is sort of unending you know people can write uh you know <laughs> can go back to primary work on gandhi ji they can go to secondary work and i think even second level secondary work and so on um uh, i guess it's just that probably what he stood for Uh, is something uh, eternal and fundamental and uh, uh, you know and the way the world moves i think it's always a great point of view to go back to so thank you very much for the kind of work you're doing and thank you for uh, accepting to be the uh, you know speaker today and uh, with this i will hand over to shri ram for this uh, wonderful introduction uh, i'll take a uh, moment to introduce the center for public policy as uh, professor agram indicated the center for public policy was set up in 2000 in association with the government of india department of personnel and training and the undp uh, so we are 20 years old uh, today we are heading into the 21st uh, year um, and uh, in the last year we started the cpp foundation day lecture series uh, professor steve wilkinson had given a talk uh, last year and we are delighted that professor pradeep subrat has uh, agreed to deliver the foundation day lecture this year uh, cpp is a multidisciplinary uh, area with uh, a set of very interesting faculty members working across domains uh, financial inclusion health gender political economy poverty uh, infrastructure um law regulation and a range of things uh, we are a think tank uh, we do a fair amount of rigorous research that informs the policy the institute runs a program on uh, postgraduate program on public policy to which the center contributes a significant amount of uh, design and intellectual inputs uh, in addition uh, we also uh, have uh, short duration programs uh, um, which uh, which which we run Uh, and recently in association with the ministry of skill development we have just launched the mahatma gandhi national fellowship program uh, which is bringing in about 75 young people and putting them into the districts after a rigorous uh, training uh, with the district collectorate so this is broadly what it is and i can go on 
but uh, that's this is not the occasion to talk about cpp it's the occasion to hand over uh, the das to the speaker but before i hand over the das to the speaker uh, let me briefly introduce uh, tridip sugrut professor tridip sugrut is currently the provost of cpt university uh, as well as the director of uh, uh, ld institute of indology he is also chair of uh, the governing council of uh, maika mudra institute of uh, communications uh, ahmedabad uh, more than all this uh, tridip is known for his uh, work on gandhi he's a gandhian scholar he's uh, uh, done i mean he spent a lifetime looking at uh, uh, how um, uh, the intellectual tradition of uh, modern gujarat has shaped up as well as uh, how the gandhian thought has evolved he was prior to coming to cpt Uh, he was the director of the sabarmati uh, ashram memorial trust uh, and also the editor uh, his most significant works include one of the major works which is a annotated uh, critical edition of uh, gandhi ji's uh, uh, my experiments with truth, uh, uh, truth which was brought out last year uh, he has also worked on a critical edition of hind swaraj and today uh, he is going to talk about uh, local self governance uh, gandhi ji's ideas uh, of hind swaraj and its relevance in the current world the title of the talk is uh, uh, the center cannot hold um, so obviously this is the right time to talk about decentralization this is the right time to talk about uh, local self government i would invite uh, professor tridip surut to deliver the second foundation day lecture a very warm welcome to you, professor surut uh, it's all yours thank you professors um raghu and shriram very honored um I wish it were different and i was in bangalore on your very beautiful campus um and the evening could have been well spent um so thank you um uh, and thank you all for for joining this evening uh, what we going through is um more than 140 years ago was described by karl marx in very evocative terms he spoke of it as something he he used the phrase all that is solid melts into air and that's really what uh is what what he thought was uh the fate that awaited us um soon thereafter yeats spoke and wrote of this very haunting image of the center cannot hold the second coming um second coming of christ uh, begins with this idea of of things fall apart the center cannot hold but two lines thereafter there is a very important idea and that's really what i wish to begin uh with is this the ceremony of innocence is drowned and what is this ceremony of innocence and what does it have to do with gandhi what is what does it have to do with the way we read hind swaraj or way we engage with the text i know that the word innocence uh, in our times has come to be devalued uh, we of course have no faith uh, in a life before knowledge in a life before fall in a life before we disobeyed Uh, and it's not that kind of innocence that one is talking about what one is trying to think of is a possibility of suspending our great temptation for this thing called the modern world uh and unless we suspend our temptation our need to belong to center ourselves uh to locate ourselves within this thing called the modern world probably any reading of hind swaraj would become very difficult uh so it's really with a plea for innocence that i begin that we have to uh in order to read the hind swaraj we have to uh to try and think in a paradigm from a philosophical ground which is constituted differently from the ground that we are used to thinking about ourselves our world the materiality of it and also our spiritual longings within it we know that um 
the Hind Swaraj was written in 1909. Uh, Gandhi was 40. It was written aboard a ship, Kildonal Castle, using the stationery of the ship, uh, written in Gujarati in a dialogical form. And he spent roughly 11 days writing this 20 chapter text. And it met with a very strange fate. It met with a strange fate because during Gandhi's time, and even thereafter, almost everyone, his associates, his friends, his colleagues in the political party, as also his opponents, thought of this text as something that was had to be neglected. It was seen as a folly. We know that Gopal Krishna Gokhale told him when Gandhi gave him this text that you would discard it soon after reaching India. Nehru chose to forget, forget it. In 1945, Nehru writes to Gandhi saying, I have only very vague memories of it. Uh, Savarkar, on the other end of the political spectrum, thought of the text as obscurantist, uh, something that would only push India away from this march to modernity, to, to freedom, to, to things that uh, go beyond political freedom uh, and, and the kind of freedom that only modernity can provide. Uh, so a range of responses that come to Hind Swaraj in Gandhi's lifetime are of the kind which says, this is a text that does not need any engagement with. In his lifetime, the, the first person to engage with it uh, deeply was a, was a bureaucrat, was in fact an oriental translator in the colonial office in India, who, when this book arrived on the shores of India from South Africa in Gujarati, it was his job to actually tell the masters as to whether this book was something that should be sold in India. And in his report, he says, it's a dangerous text. It's dangerous because it speaks of nonviolence. It's dangerous because it asks Indians to have nothing to do with the British. It poses a cultural challenge. So here is a translator, an oriental translator, who therefore goes on to say that this dangerous text needs to be proscribed. Gandhi, ever the lawyer, saw there was a loophole. The text that was proscribed, which was banned, was the Gujarati text. So hurriedly, as he says, he dictated a translation or a paraphrase, actually, uh, that's the term that he chose to use, to Herman Kallenberg, uh, his friend, collaborator. And that's the text that we read as the text of Hind Swaraj in English. Uh, those who know Gandhi's writings know that this is the only text that Gandhi chose to translate for himself. All the other texts, all the other major texts or key texts were translated for Gandhi by others. Of course, he had a, a role to play in it, but this is a text that's available. Uh, if one were to read the English and the Gujarati together, one begins to see how the intertextuality between the two texts operates, but that's not really what one needs to get into it uh, here. But on the reception of Hind Swaraj, none of Gandhi's major associates actually write about it, with, 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 with a minor exception of Kishore Lal Mashuwara, none of Gandhi's major associates, interlocutors, people who sought to, uh, to take his ideas to the people in a way that were comprehensible, uh, none of them actually engage with the text. The only time a serious attempt was made to engage with the text was in 1938, when the Aryan Path magazine, a theosophical magazine, chose to do 
especially Shu of the Aryan Path, which printed the text and the responses therein. What's very interesting about the set of responses is the responders. There's not one Indian in that list of people who, who responded to it. The responses came from a certain persuasion of European thought, which looked at the possibility of Hinswaraj as a kind of a redemptive text. It's only in 90, after 1975, it's in fact in the aftermath of the emergency that Indian intellectuals uh, and political actors began to look at the Hinswaraj with any seriousness. In the language in it was originally written Gujarati, it took a hundred years uh, before the first commentary on Hinswaraj in Gujarati to appear. So it's not a text that people actually read uh, within the Gandhian intellectual tradition uh, and even outside. All the, all the engagement that we find with the text has been of very recent vintage. Uh, since 1975, it's when we really began to, to engage with the text, translate it in, 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 in various languages, provide critical readings, um, provide uh, explanatory frameworks for it. Why is this text then therefore neglected? Or why is it that we find it difficult to read in Swaraj? Uh, it's not the language. It's, it's perhaps one of the most accessible philosophical dialogues written in the modern times. It's not its politics because the politics of it is very clear that it's anti-colonial politics and it should have been a very major text uh, of the anti-colonial um, theories of its politics. We find the text at one level alluring, at another level deeply troubling. And where is this allure and trouble coming from. And if we were to spend some time thinking about it and then thinking about three or four major responses to the text, maybe we would be able to understand the nature of the philosophical ground that Hinswaraj seeks to posit. I remember um, Professor Ramchandra Gandhi, perhaps uh, modern India's best philosopher, spoke of Wittgenstein's Tractatus as an entrenched text, literally a text written from within the trenches during the Second World War. Uh, if you were to take the same metaphor and, and look at it, the Hinswaraj has all the markers of having been written aboard a ship. Uh, there is a certain liquidity to that prose but not only a liquidity, but it is also unsteady. Uh, the prose varies. Um, at some points, uh, the prose is so vernacular that one of Gandhi's closest associates, Vinoba Bhave, called the language of Hinswaraj vulgar. It's the vulgarity that sometimes is either attractive or something that repels. But it's also this unsteady movement of the argument, uh, the back and forth, uh, not completing an argument entirely and picking it up later, three chapters later. That kind of structuring of Hinswaraj has also been making the text a difficult text to read. But we are, we are capable of reading very difficult texts and that's what we do. Uh, so it's not the difficulty of the text, but it's really the liquidity of its prose, the unfinishedness of its arguments uh, that make Hinswaraj very alluring. What is that moment at which it is written? And we have to understand the moment both not the biographical moment in Gandhi's life when he writes this at the age of 40 uh, in 1909, but the philosophical moment. Because Hinswaraj makes two assumptions and those assumptions are very important. Unless we contend with those two assumptions uh, philosophically, 
and politically, uh, reading of Hind Swaraj becomes very difficult. The first assumption is that it is possible to conceive of life, life as it's lived, with all its complexities, with its political economy, with its materiality, with its spiritual quest, with its social organization, with its governmentality, it's, but it's possible to conceive life and civilization outside the rubric of modernity without any necessary reference to the modern world. It's not therefore pre-modern, it's not therefore anti-modern, it is amodern. It is possible to conceive of life and it is necessary for Gandhi to conceive of life outside the realm of modernity. And that's the first philosophical assumption, that it is possible and it is this text is written with an awareness that even empirically modernity was not the large fact that it was to become for us, that it was something which was a possibility, one of the many possibilities available to, to human beings, to states, to civilizations, to societies to think about, but it was not the only large fact uh, that you needed to contend with. That's one. At the same time, modernity is very much present. Uh, the text has all the markers of modernity. Gandhi has all the markers of modernity. Here is this man who's trained and who's still a practicing barrister, who's traveling from the capital of the empire to another part of the empire where he has gone as an immigrant. As, 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 uh, to, 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 to practice his craft, his trade. It's written and to be printed, and printing is quintessentially modern artifact, and printing in Gujarati was even more modern than printing in European languages, more re of more recent origin. And there is, there are the two characters of that dialogue, which cannot be imagined without the world of printing. One is called the reader and the other is called the editor. The editor and printer are, are two characters who inhabit the space called the newspaper. Uh, and it is that space that Hinswaraj wishes to occupy. It is that space that Hinswaraj wishes to address itself to. Um, so there is the fact of modernity. Many of the references therein, political, polit uh, cultural, uh, of political economy, are also things that recognize the fact of modernity. So it's not a denial of modernity that takes place. It is written with an awareness that the modern world is upon us, that he is a part of the modern world, that we, many of us, are part of the modern world, but it is not the only world that's available to us. It's possible philosophically to conceive, not just philosophically, but also empirically to conceive of worlds other than the modern world. So the, these two things, the, the absence of modernity as the only fact, but also the awareness of the fact that the modern world is upon us uh, and that we have to contend with it, begins to, to, to form um, the essence of Hind Swaraj. Also, we have to recognize that the kind of colonial enterprise that Gandhi speaks of is also a modern artifact. Uh, it is very different from the medieval uh, imp uh, impulses of empire building. Uh, it is very different from that empire is very different from the kind of colonial enterprise that Gandhi talks, talks of in Hind Swaraj. So that's the philosophical ground from which Hind Swaraj emerges. And unless we recognize that, thinking about Hind Swaraj becomes difficult. And therefore, and that has marked our, our reading of Hind Swaraj subsequently, that many of our commentators, many of the readers, have not been very comfortable with this idea that modernity 
was conceived, at least in Hinswaraj, as a transitory fact, as something that is ephemeral, as something which is not lasting, as something that is both certain to be destroyed, uh, but also has the seeds of self-destruction within. But even if we were to not conceive and talk about the destruction of modernity from within, uh, the fact that Gandhi spoke of modernity as a transitory phenomena, as a transient phenomena, as something that is, he calls it ephemeral. Uh, and he, at one point he calls it a play of three days. It is not going to last for more than three days. So that conception of modernity is something that has, uh, that has bothered a lot of readers of Hinswaraj. Um, and th therefore, many of the readings of that text and therefore of Gandhi have come to think of Gandhi as anti-modern. Uh, um, uh, and if you're very charitable, you would call him a Luddite. Uh, but if you're not charitable, then you would begin to think of Gandhi as, as an anti-modern person, not recognizing that Gandhi has very large uh, contribution to make to our understanding of modernity, to the way we grapple with modernity in the early 20th century and late 19th century. Uh, uh, that Gandhi is aware of the modern political economy as it played out at that point. Uh, uh, he is aware of flows of labor. He's aware of the flows of capital. Uh, so he's not somebody who is either indifferent or ignorant of uh, how the political economy of the world has been constituted, what role the empire plays in it, what role the colonies play in it, what role does primary agriculture plays uh, into creating that, and what role does migrant labor, uh, in this case to South Africa and East Africa, uh, plays in, in, in creation, and also the entire Asia-Pacific Rim, plays in creation and, and, and sustaining that political economy. So Gandhi is not uh, unaware of the modern world. In fact, he is very much part of that modern world. He's a product of that modern world. But if you would begin to think of Hinswaraj as an anti-modern text, then your three points of unease or four points of unease with the text come from four metaphors that Gandhi uses. Uh, and I'm using the word metaphor. Uh, one, of course, um, are the lawyers. Uh, not very easy for me to wish them away, uh, but they are lawyers. Um, then there are the doctors. Then there's the railway. And there is the fact of the parliament. Uh, and a lot of readers of Hinswaraj have tended to, to focus their attention on these four metaphors uh, uh, of the lawyers, the doctors, the railways, and the parliament, uh, and said Gandhi is talking either unpractically or talking in a language of anarchy because of his wanting to wish away the parliament uh, is seen as, as bordering on uh, speaking of people's power, of the kind of direct democracy uh, that only anarchy could, could only lead to a situation of anarchy. But the three other things, uh, how could one conceive of life without lawyers? Uh, I can't. Uh, how could one conceive of life without doctors? Uh, and and what about railways? Uh, what about all the modern conveniences that uh, railways provided us and continue to provide us for both the movement of people and particularly of goods and at one point of the army? How do you actually conceive of a state and a life and an economy minus the railways? Forgetting, really forgetting that Gandhi is talking about these as metaphors, these as emblems of the colonial enterprise. You can't conceive of the, the colonial enterprise minus the railways. You can't conceive of the civilizing mission of the empire without the rule of law that is provided. 
we can't conceive of modern life without the fact of the contract. Uh, what defines modern life is the, the omnipresence of this thing called a contractual obligation. We can't conceive of the modern political economy minus the contract, the rule of law, the recognition of private property or recognition of property uh, and, and guarantees thereof uh, and, and, uh, under law. We can't conceive of life, and certainly not these days, we can't conceive of life which is not cared for by doctors. So the care of the self um, that modernity and modern science uh, promises uh, is embodied by by the doctor. And we spoke of the parliament uh, as, as something which uh, Gandhi spoke of the parliament as something that is incapable of, of expressing the will of people, uh, of, of, of doing anything useful by itself, uh, of, of selling itself to the highest bidder. And we thought that this was an exaggerated uh, account. So we've, we are, are our unease, our displeasure, uh, our critique of the Hinswaraj, if we do it from the ground of, of saying these are essential conveniences of modern life, uh, that's the kind of argument you would enter. And then you would go a step forward and said, well, if, you know, if there was a frequent friar mile available, Gandhi would have got enough train tickets to last seven lifetimes. Uh, uh, or, or that he actually got himself operated for appendicitis uh, and that there was always a doctor as part of his uh, inner circle, that Gandhi himself was a lawyer and a failed one. Um, um, well, he wasn't. Um, he was one of the most uh, successful litigating attorneys in South Africa uh, and one of the wealthiest there. Uh, but that, that apart, I mean, but, you know, he was, he was capable of very self-deprecating um, humor and description of himself. And one of them has stayed with us that he was somebody who was very un uncomfortable in the courts of law. So that's the kind of critique that emerges. Our response to that has been to say, no, 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 no. You know, it's really um, um, what Gandhi is talking about is machines as measure of human worth. What Gandhi is worried about, that modernity and the life and the trajectory of modernity is something taking us to a situation where machines become the measure of human worth. And if they so do, where is it that it would lead us to? That's, that's the second kind of response. To which there have been other readings. And one of the most powerful readings that has come to us in the last 20 years, 25 years, has been an ecological reading. And that ecological reading which tells us that there are seeds of our ecological consciousness in modern India lie in Hinswaraj. Uh, there would be another text uh, that could be read along with it, uh, and that would be um, Joseph Kumarappa's The Economy of Permanence. Between these two, the ground for an ecological thinking or what um, later came to be called Arni Ness and around Arni Ness and others, the deep ecology came to be laid in Hinswaraj because Hinswaraj speaks of limits. Hinswaraj speaks of limits to consumption, limits to worldly ambition, limits to acquisition, limits to exploitation, and it recognizes the structural nature of poverty. It recognizes the structural nature of violence. So there has been a very powerful ec ecological critique and ecological reading which has become available to us. Between these, what is forgotten is the reason why Gandhi makes this plea and what implications does it have for our modern politics or contemporary politics the way we conceive the state, the way we conceive the citizenship, and the way we place the individual in that um, matrix. Gandhi's unease with modernity is a philosophical one. It is not about speed. Of course, speed is a philosophical notion. Um, 
we know that there is, um, we were reminded by Wolfgang Sachs many years ago to say that a car is an oxymoron. There is no such thing as one single automobile. Um, 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 it is a system. It requires and it's conceived of as a system. And it's the system of modernity and of speed that plays therein. So yes, there is the, the philosophy of speed. There is also the critique of modern medicine and, 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 and that um, although these days it's not very um, um, wise to speak of um, the critique of medicine, but there has been and there, there needs to be uh, a constant questioning of the authority of modern medicine uh, in the way uh, knowledge of the body is, is thought of and is transmitted and, and the practices that come along with it. Gandhi's unease with modernity stems from a philosophical ground, and which is simply put is this. Gandhi feels that for the first time in human history, it is possible to conceive of human birth, of the value of a human being, of human existence in non-human terms which means that actually machines and objects become the measure of human birth. If that happens, Gandhi says, it changes the, both the disposition and the orientation of civilization itself. Because if your worth lies outside of you, then what you need to strive for is not something that's within us, but it's something that lies outside of us. It is that that is the only reality that we can acknowledge. That's the only reality that we can hope for. That's the only reality that we wish to strive for. That's the only thing that should tempt us, that there should be no temptation um, other than the temptation of the material world. And that's a deeply pro problematic idea, because in Hind Swaraj, Gandhi says, what characterizes modern civilization is that both Purushartha, that's the human endeavor, and Artha, the meaning of life, are both located outside the human person. Now, if that's the case, then Gandhi says it alters everything. What does it alter? It alters the way a society constitutes itself. It alters the way what people and societies and civilizations aspire for. It alters the way in which not only human worth, but the worth of all human endeavor, societal, civilizational, material, are all to be measured by a yardstick that is not human. It could be the product of human ingenuity, it could be the product of human labor, but as we know that it has a life which is separate from, distant from the human being. And that is something that troubles Gandhi uh, and troubles a lot of people who thought of modernity as fundamentally altering human society, human relations, uh, human self understanding. Uh, understanding of oneself, one's location within the world, one's purushartha, or one's, if you don't want to use the word purushartha, or the, the human calling, uh, all of those things get redefined through the modern world. And that's the trouble uh, with, with modernity, Gandhi says. If, if, that's, if that's the modern world that we create, all all the apparatus that we would create would either be of the kind that would further research at one level, or in order to inhabit you, it would actually prevent you structurally through laws, through social constructs, through philosophical ideas, is to take you away from a possibility of finding a center within yourself, finding a center within something that is not tangibly material. 
something which is not outside of the human person. Therefore, Gandhi says that the only object that modernity has is to increase bodily comfort. He would say no harm in it. Gandhi does not have a problem with bodily comfort per se. What Gandhi's problem is that it becomes the only measure of human endeavor that there are no other endeavors possible, that society's orientation becomes such that any other search that denies or, or that places the search for bodily comfort as primary. Therefore, your notions of violence would be bodily. Your notions of violence would be of the kind which would impede the search for happiness. Your notions of punishment would necessarily therefore have to be of the kind which say we would limit the scope of your activities. We would, we would confine you. So the idea of confinement is not only in the physical space, but it is also in terms of impeding this search, this desire for for bodily comfort. And therefore, Hinswaraj sought to posit a possibility that this modernity, a large fact, nevertheless in 1909, but not the only fact, not a to total fact, not an all-consuming fact, is something that is ephemeral. That it is possible to think of life, of politics, outside of modernity. At the same time, not denying this great gift that modernity had given us, which is the gift of being an individual. Because for Gandhi, and not just for Gandhi, for all seekers after truth, for all those before him and after him, the great teachers of humankind, all of them, spoke of the primacy of the individual when it came to the spiritual search, when it came to the seeking of, of God, of, of truth. Um, it was not a collective endeavor. It never was. Uh, I don't know whether it can be, but in case of Gandhi and the teachers that he sought as, thought as exemplars, for none of them, the individual had could be negated completely because the individual is the one who goes out and searches for truth. So the idea of the individual is there not only as a spiritual seeker, because we may say that's not, uh, that's not a search that is worth our while, that's not a search that we should encourage, it only leads to uh, to, to, to more violence uh, or, 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 or it leads us astray. We could, we could make an argument against uh, spiritual search. But then Gandhi begins to extra take that idea of the individual from the spiritual realm and places the individual within the political realm. Because at every point in Hinswaraj, Gandhi is addressing the individual. It's very strange that Hinswaraj rarely speaks of collectivities. It speaks of collectivities in abstract, but all the autonomous action that we are required to do, all the action that we are required to perform is performed by the individual acting as an autonomous political subject. The fact of Satyagraha is not possible without the in autonomous individual acting in, in, in search of truth, but also necessarily in search of justice, in search of nonviolence, in search of structures which render dehumanization of fellow beings as both illegitimate and impossible. So the politics of Hinswaraj is based on the idea of the individual. And therefore, it recognizes that this 
very modern notion of us as citizens or as political actors. If you take that idea of the individual as political actor, as a possible satyagrahi, as a possible uh, one who fights or who struggles to create a more just world, a more, a more tolerant world, a more, more, a more compassionate world, a more virtuous world, perhaps, uh, you get, begin to get a different political subject. Now, it is that subject which would then define the nature of our relationship with the state. Gandhi believes that this subject, this political subject, this political actor is a self-governing entity. That this, this person, either as a part of collectivity or acting alone, or acting as part of a political group is capable of both self-governance and also of persuading others to govern themselves. Now, if you take that idea of self-governing entities seriously, then what you do is end up challenging, providing a very large challenge to the modern state. Because the modern state does not want us to be self-governing entities. It would like us to be self-disciplined. And if we are not self-disciplined, there's somebody who would tell us uh, as to how to, be, to behave, uh, how to be obedient, uh, how to be a good citizen. The state takes it upon itself to govern us because it is seen that we are incapable of self-governance. So Gandhi's great challenge to the modern state, to every state, uh, in, in modern times, both the Indian state and the states elsewhere, is that he conceives of an individual that is self-governing. It's self-governing in very large areas. So the need of the individual for the state is reduced. The role of the state therefore diminishes. Uh, the, the domain of the state gets not expanded, but gets more and more limited to very few areas of human life, of collective lives. So what you are, what you get um, is a possibility of a self-governing individual creating systems, processes, structures, which enhance the idea of self-governance. If you create the idea of self-governance and take it to levels of collectivities, you could think of economies, modes of production and consumption, which are not necessarily so interlinked, uh, which are not necessarily uh, so dependent upon production and consumption that is so physically divorced from each other, so distant from each other. It's also possible to conceive of production and consumption, which where the labor is not so absent for the consumer, where neither the producer nor the consumer are to use that famous phrase, so alienated from, from labor and the product of human labor. So what you're getting uh, within Swaraj is a possibility, uh, um, given you getting a possibility of A political system, an economic system, a system of human society, which posits individual as a self-governing entity. Self-governing, therefore, recognizing her or his limits. Because one aspect of self-governance is to recognize the limits of governance. It's to recognize not only the limits of governance, but also recognize the limits of one's own acquisitiveness. Uh, how much is it that you need to acquire? How much is, what kind of capital accumulation is, is, something, that, uh, is something that we should aspire to? Should we be creating more and more giant corporations controlled by technocrats and, and and, and, and modern capital, or should we be looking at creating the possibility that 
a lot of our production and consumption could be seen as taking place in a way where the labor of the individual labor, the individual laborer becomes valuable. I want to stop at this particular thought that Hind Swaraj is actually a text not of, it's not only an anti-colonial text, it is not an anti-modern text, it's not only an ecological text, but it's a profoundly a, a, a text of political philosophy. It's a text of political philosophy which urges us to think in terms of a possibility of self-governance. In a way that can provide us with both philosophical and political tools to challenge the might of two entities which govern our, our life, the modern state and the modern corporation. We could take a position that we don't need to do any of that. And if, if, if that's the position that we take, uh, that we are very happy with uh, the situation in which we find ourselves, uh, with or mine, with or without being confined to our homes or our workspaces, uh, then Hinswaraj is not a text for us. But if there is any unease with the modern state, if there is any unease with modern corporation, if there is any unease with the structures of capital, structures of power, structures of violence, structures of inequities that we have created, if there is any unease and if there is any search for a way out of this unease, then Hind Swaraj is a text that we need to contend with. Thank you very much.